So thank you, Katiri, Karen, and congratulations, Becky. I'm from the Midwest, and it's really great. I worked in Appalachia, and the idea that those plants are coming down really makes a huge difference for people who live there. I just want to remind us of who our sponsors are, the Chevron Energy Solutions, Walmart Corporation, Cummins, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, um, Walmart, and the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. So thanks um, a lot. This couldn't have happened without you. Um, we're now on to our next panel about mentorship and education, and here to moderate this session is our C3E Ambassador Carter Wall. Carter is the Director of the Performance Solar Division at Broadway Renewable Strategies, the largest solar developer in Massachusetts. She is uh, collaborating on a new program called The Future Face of American Energy, which aims to develop summer jobs in the energy industry for college-age women and people of color. Some of you will recall that uh, Carter has been up here already, and uh, she moderated this panel at last year's symposium. And she did such a great job, we Aww. asked her to do it again. Shucks. So thank you very much. It was much. a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Um, we're at, since we're the only session that's explicitly about women and their careers, uh, and since we're the last session, we're going to change the format a little bit. Gals, could you come up here, please? Gals? Uh, we're going to um, dispense with the uh, introductions. We're going to dispense with the presentations. We're going to scoot through some questions just while you're gathering yourselves. And then we're going to turn it over to all of y'all to ask questions and do a little, you know, whatever you want to say. So um, this is um, professional organizations are a really important part of uh, what we do in our careers. Um, I had a professor at the Kennedy School who said, you know, more important than your boss, more important than your staff, more important than any of your colleagues in your company is your peer relationships in your career. And that's what this is all about. These women, it's a great group. Um, <laughs> these women have devoted a lot of their own professional uh, time not only to their careers, but also to developing their professional organizations. And so we're going to talk about the role that those organizations play in developing women's careers. Um, so I'm going to scoot through the introductions here, and you guys can talk about your organizations a little bit later. Um, on the far end there is Kristen Graff, who you've met already, from uh, Women of Wind Energy. Uh, she's the executive director. Uh, Janet Rayberg, is, she works for American Electric Power, but she's the incoming president of the Women's International Network of Utility Professionals, which is a 90-year-old women's energy professional organization. It's amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, finally, we've got uh, Kristen Nicole, who um, is a solar professional at Gridco Systems, but she's also the co-founder with Megan Nutting, who's out there somewhere, uh, of Women in Solar Energy, which is a brand new organization in this space. So uh, we've got the whole gamut here of, um, of women's careers and women's professional organizations in energy. So it's a really good group. Um, so framing the session a little bit uh, for y'all, we're going to be um, speaking to a number of audiences that are out there. We're going to be speaking to women who have careers in clean energy. We're also speaking, there's a lot of employers out there. So we're going to be talking to employers. And we're also going to be talking to um, C3E, uh, this new organization about what C3E should be doing. So I'm going to um, just get started here. Um, thank you for being here today um, and for your service. Uh, the first question is um, about pre-professional um, activities that, that lead to career development. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis on increasing STEM courses, K through 12. A lot of emphasis on exposing women to careers in energy and training programs, post-secondary education. Um, what is your experience with these? And um, what are some really good examples of programs? What are some of the parts that we're missing still? And um, I know a lot of professional organizations are getting involved with STEM programs. Um, so what are uh, professional organizations doing? Um, I can take it. Yeah, I can start. Um, so the solar industry, it's, it's a very diverse industry. There's, um, um, when we talk about education and K through 12 education, there's a lot of organizations that are working on solar for schools, so actually deploying solar systems on schools. Um, you can talk about curriculum development. You can talk about women in uh, STEM education. 
Um, one of the first topics that we've taken up at Women in Solar on this topic is um, uh, working with the Illinois Solar Energy Association. So what they discovered was that energy was actually pulled out of the um, curriculum in Illinois. It was really just focused on math and on English. And, um, and so as part of that, students really weren't getting any edu energy education. However, what um, folks found was that there was a one-week uh, coal week exercise that was going on. So the teachers were actually um, you know, able to go on an industry retreat. They were getting wined and dined, and um, you know, they would trickle down into the curriculum, and the kids were learning about coal, and that was the only education that they were getting. So um, what we're doing is we're working with ICEA to educate over 100 teachers in Illinois on solar. Um, so we're taking a proactive approach. And so right now, Megan and I, our first um, effort is to raise funds to get 25 scholarships for, for teachers to support that effort and just educate them on what's happening in the solar industry. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Kristen? Good. Sure. Um, you know, we at Women of Wind Energy, a lot of our chapters, we have uh, 35 chapters around the U.S. and Canada that do a lot of work at the local level connecting, whether it's with um, the local elementary schools or middle schools to talk with students about uh, renewable energy and particularly wind energy. Um, we've been excited to work in partnership with an organization called KidWind, which has spent a lot of time developing curriculum for K through 12 programs. Um, and in fact, had a grant with them to do teacher trainings uh, in Maryland and Pennsylvania specifically, but supporting their work all across the country where they're doing, I think it's particularly important to, to reach out to teachers because you get a much more dramatic um, result with students if they're kind of incorporating it into their everyday curriculum. Um, I've also been excited to connect with Girl Scouts on a regular basis. They have some incredible work going on, not only in their at their local level, but also with their, um, they actually have a research arm out of the National Girl Scouts organization. They came out with an incredible report in the last couple of years called Generation STEM. And I'd highly recommend um, checking it out if you're interested in K through 12 programming at all. They have a lot of great resources about how adults can be more involved, and particularly the really critical importance for girls of reaching them before the age of 12. Um, if, you know, kind of so as early as you can get them, but if they are not exposed to STEM, science, high tech careers, and particularly to role models in those careers uh, at that young age, they're much less likely to pursue those careers in the long run. Well, that's, that's a good segue to the next question. We were talking uh, when we were preparing this about barriers, and I think it's something that has come up a lot during this session in various ways. I want to just kind of talk about barriers straight on. And, um, you know, they do exist, and, and we've all grappled with them. And, you know, sort of what are the barriers, specific barriers to young women's entry into the field and into their retention, big issue? and uh, into their advancement in their careers. What are the most effective ways of overcoming these barriers along the ways? And, and how are your professional organizations and professional organizations in general sort of effective at helping with that? Um, Janet, you wanna? Sure, I'll take that. Um, first off, I wanna thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to come to this wonderful women organization and let me talk about another women organization that I'm very passionate about. So went up. Um, has been addressing this barrier issue for 90 years now, and the three most, the most important objectives that we focus on um, is, are, are professional and personal development, mentoring, and networking. And I like to take a little bit of time to go into a little bit of examples of what we do to address each of these objectives that we're providing. So talking about professional and personal development, um, I think the problem that a lot of women have is access to information. And so what we do is we try to set up meetings, whether it's monthly, quarterly basis, to have um, women be able to come and hear industry expert, whether it's their executives or just professionals in that field talking about different energy news and trends. So we had anywhere meeting topics anywhere from cybersecurity to smart grid to regulatory, um, just a very vast um, topic that women can learn about. On top of these meetings, we have quarterly newsletters that we send out and update our women, our members on different energy um, updates and trends as well. And we also focus on building skills. And so we've done anywhere from mock interviews to um, negotiation classes that we offer. 
And one thing we did notice that a lot of our meetings, we tend to not have women in, in trade to attend. So such as women, such as line, uh, women in the lineman field or construction. And so we went out and we asked them, we said, why are you not wanting to attend this, this group that helps you know, empower and build your skills? And they would say, well, we're not comfortable in these type of settings because we're always out in the field. We don't know what to do in, in like a nice formal setting. So one of the most fun event that we did was we put together a uh, formal etiquette dining. So we had women into a room like this. We invited all the construction women in, and we taught them you know, different um, etiquette for, dining, for, for formal dining and helped them to become more comfortable so they can attend more sessions and help um, build their skills. On top of that, last year we had a conference in Ohio, and we decided to dedicate one of the conference day to a workshop promoting for women to help to learn to promote themselves. And I, a lot of the speakers um, today and yesterday talked about how women tend to not promote themselves as well as men do. So our guest speaker came in, and the first thing she said was she started asking questions, and she said, raise your hand if you did this or if you did that. And she said, you know what I noticed? And I, and I, I paid attention to this yesterday because our speaker yesterday also said, who all in here is in the energy sector? Raise your hand. Who all in here is in academia? Raise your hand. All the, I watched all the women in here. This is how you raise your hand. <laughs> the few men in here, this is how they raise their hand. <laughs> so just by body language, and I never noticed this before, but that, that's how I raise my hand. I used to raise like this. Now I learn that body language actually shows confidence. So now I try to learn to raise my hand like this. Um, and those are just some of the minor things that she talked about. But the, one of the big things that she um, talked about was in performance review. When you go into your performance review, do you tell your employer, your boss, or your manager exactly what you do and have evidence to support it? Because you know that you do a good job, but do you promote yourself all the way through? And so she was telling us exactly, you know, you need to come in there with evidence that this is what you did, this is how you did it to save the company money. And I remember a month later, one of our members wrote a letter back to me and said, I tried, I did exactly what um, the guest speaker said to do, and I got a promotion. And so uh, we were very proud that you know, what we were giving out was really improving, helping um, our members improve. And two more items, uh, mentoring. Our organization is very big on mentoring. We do informal mentoring and formal mentoring. Informal is you, know, you can come and join our organization, and you can sign up for a committee to help enhance your leadership skills. You can be a committee chair. You can be a leader or an officer. But the formal mentoring is, we, depending on your career aspiration, we will match you up with a mentor, whether it's an executive of the same company or an executive of another company, depending on what your career aspiration is, and help cross-train you. And so that's one thing that we've been doing, and a lot of companies that our members are in are interested in how we're doing it, and so they've been talking to us on helping them with their company as well. And one last thing is networking. I think that what you guys do here at C C3E is fantastic, and that's what my organization, WinUp, is trying to do. We have um, chapters in 14 states, and so we, have, we give them the ability to network not only within your chapter, but also with all the members in the, the different states. Wow, that's great. Um, Kristen, I'd, I'd love to hear about why we, what, what we're doing under uh, these. And I'd also like, I know you guys are doing some stuff with trades also, so it'd be good to hear about that too. Sure, and uh, you know what, our work with the trades is sort of just getting started, but I think that it's a really important place to think about. Um, you know, Wowie is working on a lot of the similar directions. We have an incredible online mentoring program that allows people to connect all across the country and, in fact, globally. Uh, we have uh, an incredible, also, awards program, I think, is an important part of retention, in fact, because it gives visibility to incredible role models that we have all around us. Um, and having the opportunity to see them and the variety of their pathways forward is really critical. Um, I think one of our core things, we, we sort of talk about three main things that Wowie is working on communication, or sorry, community, education, and leadership. And so uh, we talked a little before about some of the education pieces at the K through 12 level, and we do that further on, which I think is an important part of retention. Um, but there's also that community space. And so the groups and the relationships that we can build at events like this but with our home chapters and organizations that allow us to have a peer network to go to on a regular basis um, is, in, is really critical. And I think that comes back, unfortunately, to the trades in a way, because a lot of times the women that are working in the trades, um, at least the wind techs that I know that are out in the field, it's very rare that they are more than just one woman in a, in a wind tech setting. So they, 
that sort of sense of isolation from a, a broader community of other women in your sector, in your, in your field, um, can be really challenging. And so that's a big part of what we're trying to provide, is just this space and opportunity for them to come together and for us all to kind of connect and talk about these concerns. But I, I, I just want to put it out there, too. I think sometimes in this sort of a setting, where, where the vast majority of us are at mid-career, higher levels of really professional track careers, um, it can be easy to forget that there are still places where there is outright blatant discrimination sometimes. Yep. And that's the Absolutely. place I see it the most, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. Kristen? Yeah, um, excuse me. So um, I'll just speak briefly, but one of the issues that we've really picked up um, this summer, and going on your um, last comment about sort of the blatant um, discrimination is, I mean, at least in solar anyways, and particularly in the trade level, there are there's a lot of diversity in the industry. I mean, just in different um, functions, roles that people are applying. But, um, you know, there are a lot of women who are in construction. And, and you know, when you have a clash of, of that type of a, a culture coming together with, you know, policymakers and and marketing, um, you know, at our trade shows, we've had kind of an issue. It can be the Wild West. It's a little bit, you know, we've got a lot of men in the industry, and um, we've had some some issues. And so anyways, Megan and I, we wrote an open letter to the industry just talking about the, the culture of professionalism and making sure that, um, you know, women who are representing their companies at these trade shows are, are doing so in, in an environment that's professional. And um, we, we've had a mix. There's a, a lot of, um, it's actually another industry that I'm learning about, but there's, um, you know, models that are hired and booth babes is what they're called. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the wild west sometimes. And so we just have to um, um, look forward to, you know, working with some of the other, other organizations in solar. We've got SIA, Solar Energy Industry Association, and SEPA. And they're taking up the cause as well. Um, but, you know, it's a constant, it's a day-to-day -day thing that everyone has to work on. So, <laughs> well, it's great that you've been speaking up about it. It yeah. really is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's where associations like, like ours and, and, and Wowie and Winup come in handy so that women can bound together and there can be more organization and more community. That's great. I know we have a lot of employers uh, out here, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what are the most effective ways for employers to attract and retain uh, women in their organizations. Um, Kristen, I think you had some interesting statistics, so why don't we start there? Yeah, so we were just talking a little bit earlier about retention overall, and there was, um, well, first I would just say, as employers, if you haven't read the September 2013 Harvard Business Review, um, you should get a copy as soon as you can, get it online. The entire thing is on women in the workplace, and there are a lot of incredible um, kind of looking through all of the literature that's been around over the last few years um, and highlighting some of the key ways that workplaces can be involved. Um, but particularly uh, in 2008, in fact, the Harvard Business Review did another article um, on brain drain and, and retention specifically in STEM fields, the science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and across that entire spread of fields, while sometimes engineering, we still see lower numbers, 30% maybe if we're really lucky, at the entry level coming in. Across that entire field, it's getting closer to 40, a little higher than 40, approaching 50% maybe at coming out of school and entering the workforce. But unfortunately, the numbers still suggest that within 10 years, 52% of those women leave the field completely. So that's not a number that I'm happy with. I think it's totally unacceptable. Um, and I hope that there are some opportunities to look in the, that research as well to see what they found. And so just a few things that I wanted to highlight, they kind of go through a whole series of what they found in terms of main reasons that women were walking away. Um, but one we touched on earlier was this sort of, sort of sense of isolation. But another big one that I think we at WOWI are interested in trying to, to help address is uh, the mystery around career advancement and different pathways for career advancement, how to understand them and find them and know who's doing what. And some of that comes back to having a wider variety of visible role models that have made pathways in a variety of different ways um, so you can see how much is happening. Um, but I think there are also some incredible tools out there, especially for larger companies. Um, there's a book by a woman called Ann Weisberg, um, and the book is called uh, Mass Career Customization. 
And it's a way of looking at how you can start with your early stage employees, even your mid-career employees. But it's a real tool for management and about how you can talk about um, a trajectory of a career. And at what points having uh, your employee have an opportunity to have more say along the way of when they want to ramp up, when they want to ramp down, what they think they might like to approach in their, in their long-term view. And what they've been able to find is that giving women that longer perspective and that kind of sense of, we want to work with you on this through your whole life is something that builds loyalty both with those women and with their loyalty to the company. Um, and so there's some incredible resources in there about talking through that uh, and how that works. I think it's amazing. That's great. Great. Janet, do you want to? I, I do. Um, I think it's important that employers provide formal mentoring. Um, it's kind of similar to what WinUp was trying to do, was to work with the different companies that our members are in and uh, set up kind of a formalized mentoring system because it helps women um, understand and um, go to where they want to go with their careers, and they could cross-train as well. But a couple of things I think it's also important is companies need to really look at, and I think somebody in the room asked the question yesterday about working moms. I think company needs to look at ways of helping women who are working, um, who has a family and is working, um, to be able to, to adapt to the working environment. So there's a couple of things they can do. They can provide maybe childcare, maybe help with, with the payment, or provide pre free childcare somewhere or um, allow the moms to work from home or give them flexibility, flex flexible hours. So I think it's very important for companies to take a look at that, as well as um, providing educational assistance. So sometimes you know, women enter the workforce later because they're trying to raise a family, and they may not have the education as men do from the very beginning. So I think it's important for companies to um, provide that educational assistance so they can go and maybe st start out with a, a startup job position and then at night go to some schooling and then be able to advance into the career that they actually want. And the last thing I think that it's very, very important is company to support women in women organizations such as C3E. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. In uh, NUI, we, um, we actually uh, try to create networking uh, opportunities uh, for young women so they can sort of do it in a, in a way that's a little bit more neutral to their, their you know, jobs so they can kind mm -hmm. of practice. So that's a, it's a really good uh, thing to do. Great, last question, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys. So I hope you got your questions ready. Um, C3E, what should we be doing? What are the, what's your list of stuff that you know, can make us into a really consequential organization? Uh, you know, this is, as far as I know, this is the only sort of nationwide, international women in energy kind of thing that's going on. So what, what's your list of things to make this a consequential organization? You guys are the experts. Go ahead. Kristen? Which Kristen? <laughs> um, well, I'll just um, speak personally. I know, um, you know, we've talked about the mentorship and the networking and all of that. But um, one of the values that I've seen with, with C3E that's, that's great is the presence on social media, that day-to-day -day interaction. I mean, with, with women in solar energy, we're on Twitter um, every day, every other day. We're on Facebook. We're getting, you know, real news articles out there and really, you know, when job opportunities come in, we're getting them out into the network. Um, so I think keeping up that day-to-day -day conversation with people is, is, and having that robust community on a, on a daily basis is important. Social media, good, good. Janet, what do you think? I think what you guys are doing right now is fantastic, um, that you're building a networking group. Um, who, whoever organized the speed networking yesterday, that was a lot of fun. It was very exhausting, but a lot of fun. <laughs> <in the hand. laughs> um, also, the dinner, the formal dinner last night, I thought was also fantastic, because it breaks you down to smaller groups, so you actually can build that relationship better than in larger groups. Um, one thing I did think that I'm not sure that you guys already done this or not is to build an online forum. Um, so that you can pose questions and you guys can, you know, people can communicate through, through that way too. So you may have already done that, but that's something I was thinking of. That's great. great. Um, and I guess I have a, two parts that I would offer. And one is that I love how many amazing women are here in this space. And I know all of our organizations have women that are interested in a lot of the similar conversations. I would love to see um, an opportunity at some point to, to have a larger forum in person where a lot of people can get together um, and continue these conversations or maybe some more regional opportunities. I know it's hard to get folks to Boston sometimes, um, but I think it's an incredible opportunity to leverage a lot of the existing networks and the work that's already happening mm -hmm. to be able to work together. 
And the other thing that I would add that um, I think kind of builds off of, I think also something employers can and should be doing is that we really do need a lot of men involved in this conversation. Um, and so I fully and deeply believe in a, in a space for women to come together as peers and have a space to talk about um, what's going on and, and how we feel about it and career paths and, and all the complicated, complex issues that we face. But the reality is things like family leave policy can be beneficial to everyone. And the fact is a lot of men are not taking their paternity leave. And so what are some of those issues and how are they playing out in the kind of subtle underlying cultural things um, that are still at work? And how can it be a beneficial conversation for everyone? Um, so finding those opportunities and those forums, um, I think, could happen really well here. That's awesome. Yep. Thank you. OK. I'm going to turn this over to everybody out there. And all of you out there in internet world, send your questions in. And I promise you, we have somebody who is monitoring the, um, the uh, internets to get your questions and, um, and transmit them through somebody. So, um, uh, so please do send them in, all of you out there who are in streaming world. Um, so uh, I want to know what your questions are for this panel. I want to know where you have encountered effective programs, effective interventions, mentoring, whatever specific, what, what characterized those? If you're an employer out there, I want to know what your company is doing. And I want to know what your challenges are for retaining women. You know, what, what is it that you're grappling with? And finally, I really want to hear from people about what do you want C3E to do? Because all of us ambassadors are hungry for input. And we really want to hear uh, from you. So you can tackle all of those at once. You don't have to do them in a particular order. Uh, so who's going to go first? Yes. Hi. OK, I'm Janie Wise with Cassidy & Associates. I'm the lobbyist that Karen pointed out. Um, for the example of, of programs that I see working in uh, mentorship, I'll tell you that the person who gave me my first job in DC was my coworker and my roommate. So that's very helpful if you want to talk about work all day long and ride into work with your roommate and uh, be focused all the time. Um, but I have a question for all of you. Um, we have a pretty good internship program at my firm, and I'm now the intern coach since Jackie is no longer with our company. Um, but of course, I have day-to-day -day responsibilities for other things, and this is just something that's supplemental to all of the other work that I have to do. So most of our interns are fresh out of undergrad. This is their first experience in a real working environment. Um, and I only get maybe two to four months with these guys. So what can I do in that short amount of time to sort of galvanize their interest, uh, keep their enthusiasm, le enthusiasm level high, and sort of do something about this clean energy dropout rate that you were talking about? Can I go first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things that my college does, which is really awesome, is uh, they have this thing. It's kind of like Take Your Daughter to Work Day. It's an externship program. And when you've got a very short period of time, we do it over the uh, winter break. Uh, when you've got a very short period of time, we, we, um, uh, we basically, it's kind of like um, speed interning. Uh, we set up uh, different, uh, like, a half a day with different kinds of people in different parts of the uh, profession. I had a, a young woman who was interested in going to environmental law, and I was like, advocacy, corporate, you know, regulatory, what do you, and sh we, so we did all of it. So if you've got a very short period of time, uh, just try to like, just blast them. They can take it, they're young. Just blast them with you know, exposure to different aspects of, of everything that you do. That's, that's mine. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I think I have a, a couple of just general thoughts. One is, um, to the extent you can be, as an individual, interacting with them as authentic and transparent about your experience and what it's been so far, I think that's incredibly meaningful. I also think the opportunities that you can set up to help network them with the other people in your organization or your other contacts around are also incredibly meaningful. I um, was at Senator Shaheen's office this year and learned that uh, each of her interns gets at least one day to shadow her for a whole day. Um, whatever meeting she's going to, wherever she's going, she gets they get that exposure. And I think something like that, that sense of 
seeing what someone in the high level position that you may be considering, what their day is like, what's going, excuse me, what's going on, what they're thinking about, how it's working is incredibly important for, for kind of winnowing out that path. I think to the extent you can give them a connection to each other um, and build that interconnected relationship that they can continue to peer mentor as they move on through their careers and build relationship, um, I think that's important. And then just kind of the broader education. And then one minor wowie plug for anyone working with uh, students uh, or recent grads, uh, we run a, a program that was part of what Wowie was founded on called the Rudd Meyer Fellowship, which is for people, particularly if you're interested in wind energy, uh, to attend the annual wind power conference. And so every year we bring between six and 10, and it's a competitive application process. It's a small thing, but um, it's an incredible moment of access to those networks, um, to the industry, to the technology that's going on. And we spend a lot of time kind of helping prep them for that setting. So I think also, if you only have a small window, is there a big conference, or is there a big event, or is there something like that that you can help get them access to and help them think a little bit about navigating it? That's what I awesome. I, I like to share um, my own experience. Um, my background is electrical engineering, getting my bachelor. And um, I remember my senior year, I didn't, you know, the trend at that time was going into robotics. That's like the cool thing. You want to go to, to uh, work for NASA or you want to work for Disney World. Nobody ever talks about energy or utility. I had no idea what they were. And so um, I just knew that I was going to start my master um, in the electrical engineering um, three months after I graduated. And so during that time frame, I'm a poor college student, and my school kept sending out emails, apply for this internship, apply for this internship for um, AEP. And I didn't really know. I'm like, you know, I just need some money. So I applied for it, and I worked for them for three months, and they offered me a, a job. And I was like, wow, and I really enjoyed what I was doing. And I was debating, should I go back to school full time, or should I you know, start work and then um, do school part time? And I chose to take this path to start my career and uh, go back to school part time and loved it ever since. And of course, when I entered utility, it wasn't about clean energy, but now I, I am in the clean energy field. And I would not change it for going back to do robotics. I would not do that. But I think what <laughs> my point is, I think schools, um, especially in the university and colleges, what they should do is team up with more energy um, industries and talk to them about what opportunities do you have for our students. Because a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. And if you provide that opportunity and let them get exposure to it, I think that will convince them that, hey, energy could be sexy. <laughs> it is sexy. It is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next one, anybody? Come on. Where's the, where's the mic? Employers out there, what are you grappling with? Okay. Come on, mm -hmm. what do we got? Yeah. I, 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 I'm not going to talk grappling with from an employee position, but <laughs> one thing, one thing that, that I know that I get a lot of, um, because I have children that are maybe a little bit younger than you all, but not a lot, and I would encourage others to do, it's we need, especially for our daughters, to create networks and to mentor in that regard. And so, you know, I, I try to, as an employer, when I get emails in from people that are, you know, one, two, three friends removed, still make sure to try to get them into the pool, get them into the intern programs if they're qualified. So I guess I'm just encouraging all of us to think more broadly about networks than just the business network. It's also your family. And we also, you know, we stand as role models for our children and we need to help those kind of networks form as well. And I've been very enriched by it. It takes a lot of time, and a lot of time I often don't have to do informational interviews and those sorts of things, but I've never regretted one minute of the amount of time that I've spent doing that. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for getting you into the industry? Um, actually, I tripped into it through a job, but it was a, a male mentor in a law firm, Van Ness Feldman, which is a boutique law firm in uh, Washington, D.C. And I, uh, I fell into it uh, out of the policy world and wanting to come and make a difference. And I've never regretted it, much like you. It's been a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. it's been fun for 31 years. Wow, that's great. Anybody want to talk about their, uh, their educational experiences that led them to it? We have over, you got okay. the, I was going to say I have a oh, question. Oh, you've got a tweet. From, yes. I do. Awesome. I do. So the question is for the panel, um, ideas for clean energy startups, small companies, to foster their ability to attract and retain women employees. Um, I would imagine for a small company that's very difficult because a large company could invest in mentoring and 
such. Right. I would be remiss if I didn't mention, thank you, at this moment, uh, the, um, uh, my former employer, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, has this really great internship program. Is there anybody here from CEC right now? Talk to them. <laughs> um, that has been in place for a couple years now uh, that's actually um, uh, deliberately uh, for smaller companies which can't necessarily afford internship programs and so forth. So um, it's been a tremendously, uh, I think you guys won an award, didn't you? Uh, tremendously successful program. Uh, they make internship funds available for companies. They go out and they recruit a nice demographic of um, people to apply for them. And that's, that's a really, really nice thing. So you should go back to your states and demand that they do the same thing. Uh, that it's really been very good. It is a challenge for the smaller companies. Anybody yeah. else, Scott? Well, I, th I mean, for me, I'm, my, um, my, my um, full-time role is with Grid Coast Systems. We're an energy startup out in Woburn, Mass. Um, and it, it's interesting. I mean, it, it is interesting. The dynamic we've got, um, the majority of our team is engineering and technical staff. Because we're a startup, you don't have the funds necessarily, not necessarily the funds, but the, the bandwidth or the resources to invest in sort of an external facing uh, staff yet because we're, you know, we're in stealth mode and we're still um, working, you know, very hard internally. Um, so, you know, I think the conclusion of that or what I've learned or taken away from it is that it's really incumbent on the leadership um, within a startup or within a large organization to make a concerted effort um, to invest in women. And when at Gridco, I was talking well, about this issue with my CTO last week, actually, and um, he was saying that what, what we were doing was really investing in women because it's a cultural issue. And it's not necessarily that um, you know when you have an entire company of men that the culture is bad, but it's, it's almost a liability because you're missing out on all the creativity and all the things that women bring to the table. Um, so I, I, you know, it's, it's tough because, you know, as Kristen was saying, as, as um, women progress in their careers, that retention really creates a more limited pool. So it is, it is tough when you look at a host of, of electrical engineers and 90% of the applicants that you get are men. Um, but it's, it's incumbent upon the leadership of the organization to make a concerted effort to make a professional and, and cultural um, um, step towards having a diverse staff. I would just add that you know even if you're a small company these days, I know that means uh, energy and time are spread thin. But with all the resources we have um, between LinkedIn and groups and all of the organizations, I mean there are three organizations right here. There are more like mm -hmm. us. You know if you just reach out to us, we I I assume I'm making an assumption here, but I get calls <laughs> all the time about yes. people that want to get into the wind industry and how can they do it and where can, what angle should they come from. And I'm not just talking about students right out of school. I get those calls, but I get it kind of all the way up the pipeline of people that are interested in this field. Um, and so to the extent I know what opportunities are out there, we are thrilled and happy to be helping do some of that matching on an organizational level. And I think for those of you looking for things, that's also a good opportunity to find those spaces. Um, and then I would just also say it's an opportunity to connect with other startups, with other women in startups, to kind of have that space of peer mentoring, even if you can't have it within your own company singly, you can either match up with other companies or through organizations like ours um, for that sort of support and networking throughout. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. What do we got? Any other questions? Anything else? Yeah. yeah. I'd like oh. to raise a question about uh, the blue collar side of the work and women in energy in the blue collar side of the work. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to figure, uh, I know that for my experience, I remember when I first came to MIT, I met this woman who was an electrician and I asked her, what was it like to, to be an electrician at MIT? And she was the first woman electrician at MIT. And so you can imagine what she had to say. And I feel like this is a, a domain in which Everyone has to have skills and everybody has to ha comes new to the field. So the ability for women to move into not just the white collar jobs, but the blue collar jobs, uh, it's really important from the standpoint of a working family. How can we make those links uh, beyond the university and beyond the state college system? Because that's actually the majority of women that are still out there looking for work. Yeah. 
Yeah, we have a brand new, uh, uh, in my field, we have a brand new organization that's called uh, uh, Women in Electrical Contracting. And uh, it really is, um, uh, it's a small organization. Um, we really are uh, kind of grappling with that, um, how, to, um, how to sort of change, uh, you know, very, very long practices, because you're right, I mean, that's sort of the, the that's the, one of the really big hurdles that uh, still remains. It's a big one to get over. Yeah. I'd love to just, um, there are a few organizations that exist that are doing some of that work already, have been connected with um, the electricity sector, but also with other trades organizations. There's a group called Wider Opportunities for Women that is doing um, incredible work both on the policy side and on the uh, broader mobilizing and connecting women in the trades. Um, there's the National Association of Women in Construction. There are groups focused on um, non-traditional employment for women where they're actually um, bringing women in that are looking for that kind of transition or into a new career and giving them hands-on local training, apprenticeship programs, and matching them with companies that have been through a training to be prepared to bring them on. Um, and those sorts of programs, they're happening often at a smaller regional, local level as well. Um, and so being able to connect with the organizations that are doing that locally, if it's, you know, some of the bigger ones, Wider Opportunities for Women and Jobs for the Future, um, are doing that at a national level and connecting with them to find out who's in your area or, or locally available. But I think the other piece about women in the trades that is actually relevant um, to all sectors as well is the idea of sponsors and, and people who are committed to the health and growth of, their, of, of particular employees. Um, and so, you know, I was talking about the Harvard Business Re Review article from a woman named Sylvia Ann Hewlett who I recommend you read anything and everything she's written, but she wrote a, a book particularly about how we need to keep our mentoring programs but also step up to sponsors, right? So who do you have that's willing to go to bat for you? Who's willing to go into that office and say, you deserve the promotion that you're asking for, or you deserve this job that you're going after? Um, and so we as individuals need to be building those relationships so that they're ready and, and, and waiting when we need them. Um, but I think it's also a critical piece, especially if you are going to be the only woman in a certain space, that there are some men in that space, whether it is your direct supervisor or someone else, that are aware of all of these dynamics and are prepared to have your back and go to bat for you um, through all of the process of, you know, there's a lot of intense certification in some of the trades and there can be some intense programming. And so to the extent we have uh, support as a network of women for women in the trades, but also that we are helping to build men that are supportive of women in the yeah. trades as well. Yeah. It's critical. Oh, I like that. All right. Um, so you're, we've, we've run out of time, but um, I really want to get all of your ideas for what C3E can do, because it's, um, it's going to be a mighty organization. I worked that in there. Uh, so um, I, yeah, the price of admission to this exclusive uh, symposium is uh, either tweet or um, send to c3enet.org your ideas about what's the best thing that we can do. What do you want to see us doing <coughs> next year uh, for C3E? Because we really need all of your uh, ideas and all of your brains um, working on helping us out. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, there is one more panel. I'm sorry. I, I thought we were the last one. After this one, the uh, advancement um, for the developing world. And um, before that, we're going to have uh, Ella Weinstein, who's going to um, be introducing the uh, award winner for. She's over there. Hey, Ella. So thank you very much, everybody. Oh, yeah. Photo first. All right, you ready? We're going to do our thing.